Thank you. And again here, I start with a quote. And as you'll have gathered from Kaduri, British writers a hundred years ago, as we see with Shakespeare, who of course was really Kit Marlowe, uh, empire makes fine writers, except maybe in America. Uh, 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 Churchill at least could, come, could cover up his endless crimes, outrages, and pathetic bungles with phrases. And all people want to remember were the phrases, not the lies they're covering up. Mark Sykes is a man who, again, one of the figures Kaduri loved to focus on, my teacher. Obscure bureaucrats who nobody knows exist as not while they live, but they have the real power and they tell the political buffoons what to think. It is not that the political buffoons are in fear of these people or that really there are people, you know, who are pulling the strings uh, because they're grand masters of the Freemasons or the Orange Lodge or the Catholic Church or this or that. It's much more bizarre and simple than that. All our leaders spend all their time being politicians and playing political games, and they don't have time to actually learn about anything serious from anyone who's honest and efficient. So they are, and also they're all suckers for flattery. So they always listen to the most ob ob obscure bureaucrats and flatterers who have only gotten to where they are because they are bad at their jobs, not good at it because they are bad at their jobs and not good at it. The very, I have to give a, uh, I love giving these lectures, but I have to give some bad news for my live audience here now. And I think, I think you're probably ahead of this curse, and I see the, the, the wicked wit in your eyes. And it's this, the very fact that everyone here wants to learn more about history means that none of you will ever be a major presidential advisor to either the prime minister or to the prime minister of Canada or the rulers of Britain or what have you because they won't want to listen to you. You're not a flatterer, you're not a liar. You don't spin your convictions and turn on a dime. There was one fellow who's still going strong now, so I better not mention his name, libel laws being what they are. But I was, uh, I was approached by both American and, and Israeli uh, political activists in uh, about this fellow in when I was working with him in Washington for 35 years when he was a bungling idiot and they said look we think this guy is working for the Saudis or the PLO can you find out who he's really working for and I said sure I'll, I don't know but I mean I'm, I'm curious myself because he's coming up with the strangest stuff and what I found was he was quite definitely working for the Israelis not for the Saudis or the PLO at all in so far as he was pleasing them, he was probably doing so to penetrate them on behalf of the Israelis. But there was a different factor. There was an editor I worked with, a very eminent and able fellow, who again, I won't embarrass by mentioning his name now. He became a US government official eventually, which means they can't all be idiots. But I, I, at that time, he was a senior editor in the same newsroom. He comes to, I come over to him and he, he's got his head buried in his hands. He's editing a story written by this fellow. And he says, Marty, can you make sense of this, of this trash? I can't. He says, I know somebody is paying X, Y, Z to write this nonsense. The trouble is he writes so badly, I can't work out who's bribing him. This is the kind of people we're talking about here. I'm going to read you an analysis from the main British advisor and strategist on the Middle East in World War I, who was the architect under Churchill of establishing the British Empire after World War I, right? His name is Sir Mark Sykes. He is arguing in favor of why the British should give the Balfour Declaration, uh, issue the Balfour Declaration in favor of a Jewish national home in 1917, right? Quote, now remember, this is 1917. The Russian Revolution has just happened in Moscow and in Petersburg. Uh, Lenin and Trotsky, who happens to be Jewish, and Stalin are already shooting all the Zionist, political Zionists in Russia. They hate Zionists, like Zionism like poison, right? The Zionists in Germany have been dropped by Ludendorff and the German generals, who are anti-Semites to begin with anyway, right? In the United States, there is no Zionism. The man who will become known as a leading Zionist in America, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who the President Woodrow Wilson does hold in high regard, in fact, never champions a Jewish national home and opposes it bitterly through the 1920s and 30s up to his death. 
His ideal is a joint Jewish Arab mutually tolerant state, which actually would have been delightful, except nobody on either side wanted one. So it was impossible for that reason. But politically, the Zionists don't exist, right? You have to understand this. And what does Sir Mark Sykes tell the Prime Minister of Britain at the time and other senior officials? And Arthur Balfour, former Prime Minister, future, now Foreign Secretary. To my mind, the Zionists are now the key of the situation. The problem is, how are they to be satisfied? With great jury against us, there is no possible chance of getting the thing through. He means winning World War I against Germany, right? There is no with jury against us. We can't win World War I. How many army divisions did the Jews have? None. How much independent financial power did they have then? They had none. The Rothschilds had lost half their wealth because they bet on peace in 1914 and were more taken by surprise by the outbreak of war than anyone else. So uh, with the Zionists against us, what does it mean? It means optimism in Berlin, down in the dumps in London, unease in Paris, resistance to last ditch in Constantinople, from the Turks, dissension in Cairo. So he also assumes that the Jews are telling uh, the Turkish Ottoman Empire what to do and what to fight, and that the Turks believe them, right? Arabs all squabbling among themselves. And then he gets literary. He says, as Shakespeare says, untune that string and mark what discord follows, right? And then he goes on, but what happens if we satisfy the Jews, oh, if they, want, if, if they, the Zionists, want us to win, they will do their best, which means they will, A, calm their activities in Russia. The only activities in Russia they had were being shot by the communists or being torn apart by uh, the Tsarist loyalists and pogroms at the same time. B, there will be pessimism in Germany. Well, there was, but not because of any Jews, it was because they were losing the war. Stimulate in France, England, and Italy. These countries had lost millions of dead. They didn't give a damn about bizarre uh, 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 you know, uh, fa fantasies about imagined Jew uh, Jewish background power. Enthuse in USA. This will be subconscious, unwritten, and wholly atmospheric. Good thing for him to say because that means you don't have to prove it. And since it doesn't exist, you can't prove it anyway. You see, this guy is an idiot and he is ignorant, but he knows how to play the political game. His name was Sir Mark Sykes, and he was never held to account because he conveniently died. In his case, he wasn't murdered. It was because he caught the Spanish influenza, the great pandemic in Paris in 1919, when he still thought he was deciding on the future of the world. But this is the comedy of errors where we find Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann was one of 15 children from, uh, from an obscure Jewish family in Poland. Doesn't come from wealth, doesn't inherit any wealth. But he comes from, he's a bright, ambitious, arrogant little son of a bitch of a boy, and he wants to get on in the world. And he goes to technical school, and he becomes a chemist, uh, an industrial chemist. He becomes a rather good one, not world class, that's part of the myth and it's not true, but a very able man. He comes to Britain and he becomes an obscure chemist in the Manchester Institute of Technology. At first, his English is so bad that he has to pay, uh, 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 pay, pay students to translate from him from his German into his English. Right? But British technology is so far behind Germany at the time that obscure though he is, Chaim Weizmann becomes one of the most eminent acetone chemists in England which means he goes to work for the Royal Navy, helping them make explosives uh, in 1914-1915, which is important, since most of their best scientists were Germans and patriotic Germans who went back to Germany when war began, and the British had not trained enough chemists themselves. So all of a sudden, the Chaim Weizmann is in demand. He's also Jewish, and he's also a Zionist, and he dresses extremely well. Now, as I said before, one picture works worth 10,000 words, uh, all, uh, all my life, I've been like any, any son of, of Ireland in my generation, especially in the anti-imperial era, uh, I dressed like a schlum, right? It's me. Weizmann belonged to a generation of aspiring people. He dressed like a millionaire when he didn't have two pennies to rub together. 
Take a look at this picture and take a look at the impeccable little finely pointed beard he has there. This is a man who is a chancer, who has nothing in life till he is 45, and suddenly the British government regards him as the head of the Zionist movement in Britain. Wow, that means uh, on his recommendation, the Jews will control policy in Russia and America and France and Britain. Now, Weizmann has no conception of this. He knows that the Zionist movement has nothing going for it except hot air and smoke and mirrors and bluff. He actually does know this, right? Take a look. Yeah, interesting pictures. All of those pictures, of course, are the later Weizmann, the dignified Weizmann, the world figure Weizmann, and he had charisma. My teacher, Isaiah Berlin, who was one of the greatest political philosophers of the 20th century, a man who was a personal intimate of Winston Churchill and David Ben-Gurion, and of Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, and who, uh, who covered and advised uh, 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 pr uh, pr uh, uh, on the policies of President Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, he revered Weizmann. He later on came to realize he was dealing with a, uh, no, with, with a bad-tempered, rather sleazy con artist. But he never really admitted to that. And even after Weizmann dies, Berlin says, this is one of the greatest men in modern history. He is an even greater figure than Winston Churchill or Franklin Roosevelt. Now that's hogwash. The leaders of modern Israel came to see through Weizmann in the 1930s when they had to negotiate with him with the British Empire. And Ben-Gurion and Moshe Sharet, who became eventually foreign minister of Israel, and the future military leaders of Israel are horrified about an empty, ridiculous man, Jabotin, not Jabotinsky, Weizmann is, which of course is exactly what makes him ideal for the British. Because Weizmann has a conception. Weizmann's conception is that Britain will build a Jewish national home, and eventually the Jewish national home will grow into a British protected uh, uh, state in the British Empire and Commonwealth in Palestine. It will be the seventh dominion of the British Empire after India and Canada and New Zealand and South Africa and uh, Australia and any others I have missed. This is the conception at the time that Weizmann and uh, uh, his followers thought, and it, if it sounds insane to you and childish, it was. But it was believed at the time, not just by Weizmann, but by the Anglo-Jewish establishment at the time in what was still an empire that ran a quarter of the world. And when I was a young research student in London, a postgraduate student under Kaduri and at the British Academy of Arts and Sciences in the 1970s, I was actually tasked uh, 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 by Sir Isaiah to do a little bit of the, the not quite dirty work, but you, you know, the grunt work that you always send the youngest kids, the newest kid on the block to do. If it's in the army, you get them to clean the latrine. And if you're in academia, you send them to sort through the papers of extremely unimportant figures in the British Zionist movement who were involved with the Balfour Declaration. And when I talked to the husbands and wives and widows and uh, children and grandchildren of these people, I was fascinated by them. Here is David Ben-Gurion, Prime Minister of Israel, who lead, uh, creates the state and leads through uh, uh, its, its first two wars against impossible odds in 1948-56 and builds the strength and excellence that wins the Six-Day War and keeps the, the preserve the state thereafter. Now, Ben-Gurion, love him or hate him, is a figure of world historic consequence. And they have no time for him. To him, oh, he's just this jumped up little fellow, for, uh, you know, uh, jumped up little farmer from nowhere. Berlin had, a, had more insight than that, but it was a fascinating insight. It combined snobbery and genius at the same time. You don't often see those put together, uh, do you? Berlin said, I don't like him personally, but I do respect him. He reminds me of Khrushchev, the same combination of being a peasant and brutal and thuggish but of exceptionally high intelligence and administrative and political abilities at the same time. That was much nearer the mark. It still didn't do Ben-Gurion justice, but that was much nearer the mark. But you see, the English pompous, arrogant Jews, and you can tell the people who I mixed with and did not enjoy mixing with in my early 20s in London, right? They looked at Weizmann and they thought, oh, he's so dignified. <laughs> 
He's so proper. He's so pure. I see the same kind of attitude when you look at idiots who should know better talking about what a genius Paul Wolfowitz is in his conceptions for the Middle East, or Richard Pearl, or, 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 or people like that. Oh, they're so dignified, they're so visionary, they're so brilliant. Well, they actually, they are visionary because they see things that nobody else can see because they aren't there to begin with. There is no realism, there is no reality, and there is no common sense. Weizmann never realizes what the British want him for and use him for. He thinks, you see, the British think Weizmann represents a world-class science movement and that millions of Jews are waiting to join him. And they don't. The Balfour Declaration is given. Britain has its justification before the League of Nations to occupy Palace and keep, uh, and, uh, uh, keep the French out which is all they care about in 1918 to 1921. And they occupy the land of Israel and the Arabs revolt. But the British are used to native populations uh, not liking what the empire does and the empire does what it always does, it just shoots them. It's not a problem yet. But this situation, then it goes, uh, uh, the, the, the cart goes off the rails. Because Weizmann has promised the British Empire that millions of Jews from Poland will come to Palestine. Now, if you look at the right-wing Likud uh, arguments to this day, it's very interesting. They all talk about the evil of the British Empire in keeping the Jews out uh, and sending them back to death in Germany and in, the, in Europe in the Holocaust. In 1939 to 1945, this is correct. It is exactly what happened. But the Jews themselves had blown their chance 20 years before. Nobody came when they could have come, and the British actually wanted them to come. In 1921 and 1922, there is a, a, there's a very fine British historian, Professor Bernard, retired now, happily still going strong, Professor Bernard Wasserstein, we were very good friends in, in our youth long ago. Bernard must surely disapprove of me now because I am, as you can tell, an entertainer and a popularist, and he is not. But I most certainly deeply respect the conclusions in this work. And he was the first 50 more and more years ago to uncover this extraordinary documentation. The senior officials in the British colonial office in the early 1920s are outraged and write to the Zionist organization and to Chaim Weizmann in London. Uh, uh, actually, Manchester he's still living in. Professor Weizmann, you misled us. You lied to us. You told us there would be hundreds of thousands or millions of Jews from Poland who would happily come up and come to Palestine and establish this pro-British Jewish bastion in the Middle East, which would help strengthen and safeguard the Middle East that we could control for generations to come. Where are they? They aren't coming. They aren't coming. To this day, right-wing Likud people will talk about the evils of the British Empire in 1921 because they set up an independent Jordanian state under another Hashemite prince, the only Hashemite who had any brains to him, which is why his great-great-grandson is still king of Jordan to this day, uh, uh, Emir Abdullah, a very able and impressive man. And significantly enough, uh, the most striking figure who really stood for genuine peace and coexistence, if, if they could have pulled it off against their own extremists with the Jewish settlers in Palestine in that generation. He was, of course, later assassinated from his own side by a killer uh, or ordered uh, by Hajam and al-Husseini, the, uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, who himself had been appointed that situation by liberal English idiots in the 1920s. I mean, there is no end of stupidity and mutual incompetence here. Weizmann never understands the British. He thinks the British have been convinced by his own brilliant arguments for the moral case for establishing a Jewish national home in Palestine, which will be loyal to the British through thick and thin. The British do at first want the Jews there for their own purposes. And through the 1920s, institutionally, this remains the case. But by the end of the 1920s, the rise of fascist Italy and the growth of massive hostility to the Jewish national home, not just among the Palestinian Arab peoples of Palestine, but also across the Middle East, 
including, as I said before, from the, the puppets the British themselves raised up in Iraq and Egypt, including from their own puppet, King Faisal I. This causes a complete reassessment in the British government. The British colonial office, which was so strong in the early 1920s to bring hundreds of thousands of Jews into Palestine, is determined to block this process as early as 1930-31. They fail. Now, according to even idiot new Israeli historians who hate their own country like poison, the reason for this is the evil power and financial wealth of the Zionist movement in Britain, which is not true. It simply is not so. The Zionist movement in Britain uh, uh, survived by a wing and a prayer in the 1930s. They had no financial capabilities whatsoever. All they had was high Weizmann's access to the country houses of the English ruling class at the time, and Weizmann didn't know what he was doing. The British, uh, the, the, uh, Weizmann and his English Zionists think they have friends. The friends they think they have are the leaders of the Labour Party at the time, Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald and his son Malcolm MacDonald, who eventually becomes Colonial Secretary of Britain. But this is not so. Neither uh, 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 MacDonald nor his son give a damn about the Jews in Palestine or about immigration for the Jews of Europe to escape from the Nazis to go to Palestine. In fact, the only effort that is made to shut down immigration to Palestine from Europe in the interwar period takes place under a Labour government from 1929 to 1931, and the colonial secretary who is responsible for it is a Jew himself. Not religious, of course, but ethnically Jewish. Sidney Webb, husband of Beatrice Webb, founder of the Fabian movement, our old familiar friends, and if you want a scathing and very funny and witty and brilliantly insightful description of both Sidney and his wife Beatrice, I recommend to you all Chronicles of Wasted Time, the memoirs of the British journalist uh, Malcolm Muggeridge. It is filled with scathing wit about these people and what pompous idiots they were. But in 1938, Malcolm MacDonald is still in the British government, uh, ostensibly with a Labour title. He becomes colonial secretary, the Jews' great friend. Except what does he do? He approves the infamous white paper of 1939, which is a death warrant for hundreds of thousands of terrified people fleeing the Nazis through World War II. And Turkey, of course, comes back into the story as does Winston Churchill. Because the Turkish government, and historically Turkey, you must remember, was always sympathetic to the Jews, if only because the Jews were being persecuted by the Christians for a thousand years. And uh, the Jewish communities in Turkey and Constantinople had always been loyal to the sublime court. They welcomed its protection. Levels of anti-Semitism and persecution and rape and murder were far less common across the, the Turkish-controlled Middle East than they were in Europe for hundreds of years. So even under the secular Turkey, or especially under it, with Kemal Ataturk, and I have a chapter on this in my new book, Unlikely Angels, the Turkish Foreign Service has an extraordinarily impressive record of rescuing up to 75,000 Jewish people from the Nazis through World War II, and it is vastly better than the records of the State Department or the British Foreign Office at the time. They wanted to do more. They draw up a plan and present it to the United States in 1942 to rescue 300,000 Jews from the Balkans through Turkey. It is the British government of Winston Churchill that torpedoes and destroys that plan and prevents any of those poor people from being saved. In other words, once again, the actual factual history is exactly the opposite of what we imagine. And it is also the opposite of what Chaim Weizmann imagined. Weizmann is the perfect tool for the British because he is a vain, stupid man and he doesn't know what is going on around him. And uh, he takes everyone at face appearances. And in the, the only uh, negotiations he is ever involved with are really life or death, trying to maintain the principle of freedom of migration that during the Arab Revolt from 1937 to 1939 at round table conferences in London. This is the first time David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Charette and uh, Burl Katz Nelson and the other senior political leaders of the left of center social democratic 
leadership who will eventually establish the state of Israel. This is the first time they have actually seen Weizmann in, operate in person in London. Up to now, they've been just local uh, hicks, local politicians. Uh, you know, visualize in America. You know, you're big in local politics in Minnesota or in Idaho or in Little Rock. But you've never been to Washington before. You take it for granted that your senators and your congressmen know what they're doing. And in the American political system, whatever the mistakes we make in a wider area, that works because uh, uh, congressmen and congresswomen, are, why are they reelected forever? Because even Nancy Pelosi is very good at bringing back the bacon for San Francisco and for Northern California. So you expect these people to be able to operate on a federal scale in Ottawa or in Washington as well. And that's what Ben-Gurion and his local politicians who are painstakingly building up the Jewish community in Palestine brick by brick, orange tr grove by orange grove through the 1920s, kibbutz by kibbutz in the 1920s and 30s, as soon Weizmann is doing. And then they come to London in 1937 and to their horror, they discover the great man has no clothes. He's a naive idiot. A naive idiot. And he never learns. By 1948, the Israeli state is set up. It is set up exactly the way Weizmann and Jabotinsky alike never wanted it to set up. It is set up by armed revolt to kick out the British Empire, which is determined not to go. Uh, I've had strange karma in my academic and journalistic career. Journalistically, I've prospered against the odds and my own expectations for 40 years and more, far more than I ever expected to. Academically, I always say the wrong things at the wrong time. And if they're right, it makes it even worse. So in my early 20s, I come up with a conclusion that the wonderful, virtuous Labour government of Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevan and company, who did pull the British Empire out of India, who did wrap up the British Empire, who created the National Health Service, which is a very incompetent one, at home, that I discovered to my amazement, I'm not looking to discover this, and yet it's there, that they were determined to stay in the Middle East. Now, of course, they didn't succeed in this. The British are totally kicked out of the Middle East by 1958. The, the horrible coup in Iraq I told them about is the end of all of it for them. But they didn't plan it that way. They meant to stay in Egypt. They meant to stay in Iraq. They meant to maintain control of the oil in Iraq. They meant to get, maintain control of the oil in Iran. They just failed. They bungled it. They lost it. And they were blown and bombed out of Palestine by the relatively restrained revolt of the mainstream is, uh, uh, Israelis under the democratic, social democratic leadership of Ben-Gurion with the Palmach, which becomes the core of the Israeli army. And with great ferocity and ruthlessness and ugliness, uh, even though on a small scale, by Menachem Begin and his Egon, the, the Egon Svailumai, the national military organization. But both ways they are blown out. And the irony is, this is flies in the face of Weizmann. Weizmann totally disapproves of Jewish terrorism. He has a romantic medieval view that Jews are pure because they do not use guns and do not use violence. And he would disapprove even uh, uh, of gentlemen like, uh, like you, Peter, who have bravely served in the armed forces of their own nation. And Weizmann, of course, has a tragic end. He has two sons. A younger son who's a nebbish, who loathes him, and who spends most of his life as a dairy cow farmer of all things in Ireland, right? Not a thing for a brilliant Jewish boy to do. And there is an older, brilliant, talented, much beloved son, Michael. And with his father's approval, he joins the Royal Air Force as a fighter pilot, nothing less for a Weizmann. He gets shot down over the English Channel. He pull, uh, bails out of his plane and he survives in a dinghy but the British just can't be bothered rescuing him. And his body is never found. And that is what Chaim Weizmann's love of British empire led him to. We may add here people as, uh, unlike as uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, I mean, oh, again, my, my block and, uh, and yet Roger Kipling himself, the great poet, they lose their beloved only sons, almost beloved sons in World War I in bungled, needless, shameful, utterly unnecessary fiascos.
and it, it, it it's a very moralistic and uh, moral and sobering story for anyone who uh, uh, who's ready to gamble with the lives and destinies of millions or hundreds of millions of people in the name of empire too easily. Weizmann ends his life as figurehead president of Israel. And he's known as the prisoner of Rehovot because he's built a luxury house for himself and his wife near the Weizmann Institute. Uh, he never had any trouble raising money uh, for his own pet institutions. And so he lives like an English lord in the middle of Israel. And he's in his 70s and he's blind and he's dying. And Ben Gurion and the leaders of Israel ignore him. They treat him like dirt. But the irony is, you see, they are right to treat him like dirt because there is even another dark twist story. Theodore Herzl, the founding father of Zionism, was hated by the ultra-Orthodox uh, religious leaders of his time, especially uh, 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 Rabbi Israel Kagan, known as, who actually his descendants went to Montreal, who was known as the Chofetz Chaim, a strange little man about five feet tall who had a paranoia, was a Kabbalist who had a paranoia about ever having any photographs of him taken. So, so to, although he lived in 1933, there are virtually no decent resolution photographs of this strange little creep. And he hated Zionism like poison. And he appears to have joined with the circle of Kabbalists to have put a death curse, a korban, on the founder of Zionism, Theodore Herzl, who drops dead of a heart attack at 44, and on his wife, who dies in a mental asylum only a few years later, and on their three children, two of whom commit suicide, and the third of whom dies in the Asian Stadt concentration camp. And the only survivor of the, of the Herzl dynasty is protected by the British government. He becomes, uh, in the 1930s and 40s, a junior British diplomat. He serves in the embassy in Washington. And his greatest hope and desire is to go to visit the Jewish national home of his, his grandfather, visionarily founded in Palestine, but he is blocked. He is not blocked by the British government, which has no problems with this whatsoever. He is specifically and repeatedly blocked by the leader of the Zionist movement in London, Chaim Weizmann, who as a young man was jealous of Herzl and who hated him, and who uh, uh, believed that his own approach of slow and gradual settlement uh, into the land of Israel rather than Herzl. Herzl had a sense of urgency. He felt genocide was on the way for the Jews of Europe. He was right, of course. Weizmann sneered at this. But Weizmann all his life blocked Herzl's grandson from even visiting the land of Israel. And the irony was once Israel was independent, Ben Gurion and his people would have lionized him. They were all in favor of having him to come, but they, they had been blocked by the Zionist movement, when, which was run from London until independence came in 1948. And it was too late for, for Herzl's poor young grandson. He jumps off a bridge into a 90 foot drop in Washington, right beside the British embassy. He commits suicide in 1947. So uh, the, uh, finishing on a contemptible, ludicrous, and repulsive man. A man who is in the right place at the right time to appear to be in charge of uh, a great worldwide impressive Zionist movement in 1917. Though within a couple of years, when the main idiots like Mark Sykes are dead, the more sober figures in the British colonial office have come to recognize that Chaim Weizmann doesn't know what he's talking about. And they ignore him. But Weizmann ignores this. And for the next 20 years, he has no conception where his genuine friends are in British politics and where his enemies are. I have one last point on this, which I mentioned on Passau before. But again, it is utterly fascinating. And I have a chapter on this in my as yet unpublished book. Again, if anyone can help me get even a modest publisher, let me know. It's called Unlikely Angels, about the most unlikely figures to rescue hundreds of thousands or millions of people from both the Holocaust and other genocides over the past century. And one of my heroes is Henry Morgenthau, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. Another is my great fellow Irishman, Roger Casement, who ended the, the genocide of 10 million innocent black people in the Congo at the hands of the Belgian government through the 19th century. And a third of my figures, my heroes, 
is Stanley Baldwin, Prime Minister of Britain and leader of the British Empire from most of, almost all the time from 1923 to 1937. Because through the 1930s, when the British Colonial Office and the Foreign Office have both decided it is time to liquidate support of the Jewish of Jewish immigration to Palestine and to stop it dead in order to appease the Arabs and buy peace. The only figure who says no we must maintain the moral position we took Palestine on, which is to protect these poor people from murder and rape and pillage at the hands of these monstrous creatures in Europe. It was not Winston Churchill. He did not give a damn. It was Stanley Baldwin. And even lastly, when Baldwin retires as prime minister in 1937, he is still a much loved and revered figure. Churchill trashes his reputation from 1940 onwards, and it still hasn't recovered from that. But when he retires up to the war, he is still hugely loved in the British Empire. He is given literally thousands of offers to become uh, president of this charity, uh, head of this international organization. We'll make you a wealthy man. He's already a wealthy man. He was a very successful industrialist all his life before he went into his politics in his late 40s and 50s. He only accepts one position. He becomes the founder and leader of the charity to rescue Jewish children from Nazi Germany. And in the year up to the beginning of the war, they get 20% of them out. This is the real story behind the Kinder Transport. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marty. <laughs> that was quite the voyage, and uh, and yeah, I love I love just the the journey, the the doors that you open that you just shed light on, like that I didn't even know were doors to look at or to even try to open. So that that's a lot of fun. There's a lot of leads, and uh, yeah, we have to get you to do yet another follow up because I feel like you still have a lot in you. Um, that being said, <laughs> that's a fright. I'm not sure if I should be flattered or terrified by that, by that math. <laughs> Um, there's a couple of questions that have been uh, hanging in the, the chat box or the chat room area. Uh, somebody named Roy, who is in Israel right now, it's about 4 a.m., very late. He, uh, he wrote a question. He also had a, a little point to make. He said, thank you. It's 3.30 3 a.m. He said this 30 minutes ago uh, in Israel, and I can continue listening to Martin for hours. He's amazing. That's the preface for his question. Um, Get my email, Roy. I need more friends like you. <laughs> and I'm not joking. Put your email in the, the chat box for Roy. Um, so he asks, um, number one, twofold question. Number one, was Israel ever a sovereign nation or is it a similar situation to what we see in Canada? Number two, is Netanyahu an agent of these imperialists like some believe or is it something else? The first question is very simple to answer. The second one, of course, uh, is nuanced uh, uh, because it, it's like a Rorschach test. It depends what angle you're looking at, what and from. But first of all, it, it, you're, it, you make a fascinating point, Roy, because as I say, the British conception was always that Palestine, Jewish Palestine, as they then would have called it, should be within the empire. But growing anti-Semitism was making this a dead letter already in the 1930s. The Zionists and the Jewish community in Palestine had one great friend in the pars, in the ruling pars in London, and they didn't even know who it was. It was Stanley Baldwin. It was not Churchill who didn't give a damn for them. In fact, in 1944, the Irgun, not the Irgun, an organization even more uh, uh, ruthless and uh, focused than the Egun. Yitzhak Shamir's Freedom Fighters for Israel, FFE, which the British called immediately the Stern Guy. They assassinate a friend of Winston Churchill's, Lord Moy, who was the British minister in Cairo in Egypt at the time. And Churchill then pontificates and threatens Weizmann. You know, this, this shocking crime is typical of the Bolsheviks at the worst. Is this what Zionism, Zionism is degenerating to, Dr. Weizmann? If it is, those of us who have defended Zionism and appreciated it for so long will have to reconsider our views. Now, that's ch typical Churchill, pompous, ignorant old fart. It was already irrelevant what he thought or did not think of Zionism. <laughs> 
And of course, it was his own monstrous policies, which were about to also send hundreds of thousands of innocent Ukrainians and also uh, uh, other Slavs fleeing Stalin's massacres in the Soviet Union back to be slaughtered there at the end of World War II. So World War II starts with the Royal Navy sending tens of thousands of Jews back to their death, deaths in uh, Nazi Europe. And it ends with the, the, the British army uh, at the point of bayonets, forcing and tricking scores of thousands of fleeing Cossacks, Ukrainians, and other Slavs who, whatever else they were or were not, had, had not done, knew what was waiting for them and what did wait for them at the hands of Stalin after it, because Stalin didn't have tender mercies. He didn't have any mercies at all. So there was that. When it comes to Israel, Israel uh, has nothing to do with the British and nothing to do with the empire. What does happen is it's the only nation, as far as I know, that has still actually been created by a formal vote of the United Nations with the approval of the United Nations by the vote in 1947. And if you read uh, Leon Uris's histrionic, but not to be underestimated book Exodus, it's histrionic, every Arab is bad, every Jew is virtuous. I mean, it's a very childish book in those senses. But if you look at his actual sweep of history, is uncomfortably accurate in broad terms. And although he, he, he is an embarrassing novelist in having, you know, all his characters are either impossibly good or contemptibly evil and there's nothing in between. But the man was a Hollywood script writer of Westerns, no less. And so he could tell the story. And there is power in the book. And it's more effectively brought out Otto Preminger. It was a very skillful and underrated movie director. And he makes the movie Exodus. And if you look at the movie Exodus, this, and you probably find the, the, the key clips even on YouTube, the key scenes where there are people in the land of Israel and in America you know, survivors of the Holocaust, people uh, who, uh, who don't, uh, bless them, the naive, they can't imagine oppressing any other people that Israel can do anything wrong. It's a very simplistic view. But these were widely held views at the time, and people are listening into the debates of the United Nations of late success, held them probably enough. They hadn't built new UN buildings yet in Manhattan on East 44th Street. So uh, the UN convened at the site of the New York's World Fair in 1939, actually at that time. And the whole world was listening in. There wasn't television yet for any really worth the name, but the whole world was listening in under the most dramatic circumstances. The United States and the Soviet Union, again, for their own short-term and cynical views each, but you have the strange moment where the British are opposing the creation of an independent state of Israel, but the French, the Germans, not, not the Germans, the French, the, the Soviets, and the United States, for different reasons, are all in favor of it. They are all in favor of it, which is quite extraordinary. Again, what you see here is the wild promiscuity and randomness of history, how things transform and become their opposite or connect with different forces in the most unexpected way at the most unexpected times. There was even a possibility of the Jewish national home would be built in Southeast Asia. Because in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, David Ben-Gurion went there as an impoverished uh, uh, representative of the, uh, of, of the working class Jewish community in Palestine. And he couldn't afford to live anywhere except to share one of the most miserable rooms in Paris with another starving student representing another improbable nationalist movement nobody took seriously. Ho Chi Minh from Vietnam. And the two men became close friends and appear to have encouraged each other at least for the next 30 years until they both became the, each other's country's national leaders after World War II. And Ho Chi Minh assured Ben Gurion that if the English continued to be uh, 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 so imperialist and ruthless in repressing Jewish national identity in Palestine, he would make sure it could, a Jewish national home could be established in liberated Vietnam when he finally got there. I suppose we should be thankful for everyone, uh, for, uh, maybe not the Arab peoples, but all Vietnamese and Jews alike and Israelis alike should be grateful that particular complication never came about. But there were hints that it could have. 
There were hints that it could have. So Israel had nothing to do with the British Empire. As to Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Netanyahu uh, uh, is a true believer with the neocons. There's no question about that, I think, because he is an uh, Israeli nationalist. And I would judge that he's very insecure about broader ideas of the world and empire. And he's naive enough to think that Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl are great thinkers. And uh, if there's one thing you find in the world, the English are suckers for it too, but Jews especially are, and that is being intellectual snobs. That, uh, you know, we may not be a genius, but we, mind, but we follow Paul Wolfowitz because he is a genius. It's not just shoes. The number of times I have seen fourth and fifth rate people of every background, no, not African Americans, they have more good sense in Washington. But the number of times I have seen pseudo intellectual, pretentious non entities in Washington talk about what great thinkers, Pearl or Wolfowitz or idiotic clowns like these people are, or, or Charlie Krauthammer. You can get away with anything if you want to. You can, if, if you want to put on the errs and graces, you can get away with anything. I think Mr. Netanyahu falls for that. What Mr. Netanyahu basically wants above all else is uh, the peace and security of Israel, but he, he doesn't believe in any form of peace process, or uh, I think, or a humane approach to the Arabs. And having said that, above all else, he will turn on a dime on any policy, right or left, if it will give him one more day in, in, of, of political power. Of course, he's not alone in that. The Reverend Ian Paisley, who was worshipped and revered my native Northern Ireland for f 50 or 60 years, and he ends up in the British House of Lords uh, with a figure like that too. First he's for war, then he's for peace, then he's for terrorism, then he turns us back on terrorism, then he hates the peace process, then he promises to implement the peace process as long as he gets a place in the House of Lords. And when Paisley finally died, he insisted that none of the worshipping idiots in his in the independent church he had created, uh, oh, was something Presbyterian ch uh, 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 church. And of course, it wasn't Presbyterian, it wasn't really a church, it was his own cult. But all the followers who had made him a millionaire and a wealthy man for 50 years, he wouldn't let any of them attend his own funeral. And I think there's a strong element of that to Mr. Netanyahu. He's determined to protect Israel his way, but his way ultimately comes down to only I can be prime minister and only I can run the country and nobody else can do the job. I mean, it's like having narcissism that burns down to not just to a black hole, but to a single black singularity, a tiny point that gets smaller and smaller as it becomes more intense. So that's my take on him. Yeah, that, that's good. That's, that's nuanced, <laughs> indeed. Um, all right, Roy's happy with that. He says, thank you. Uh, Peter, you've been waiting for a while. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Martin. How grand it is to see you and to uh, attend this, uh, this lecture of yours. And there are no coincidences. This, this evening, I'm in Savannah, Georgia for the 127th annual National a Jewish War Veterans of the United States National Convention. And as you may know, I walked past a uh, bar and restaurant here in town called- Yes, of course, I, I loved your email. <laughs> I, I don't think I had a chance to tell you my reverence for Jemison's splendid whiskey is not easily gotten. My father and grandfather, bless them, felt the same way before me. <laughs> it's. Hey, it's, it's inherited, and I, her I inherited it from my uncle. <laughs> exactly. So I've, I've been slaving over some questions, and one, one of them is a, a big one, and there are, are some subparts, and I hope I don't uh, uh, drown this out in the detail, but uh, can you identify the manifest divergent in intentions, if any, between the British Empire designs on the Near East and the American designs on the Near East. And oh, uh, the answer is yes, I can. But Matt, here's another lecture for you. But it's a huge subject, but it, it really appears in the 1950s. And uh, again, my old teacher, Ellie Kaduri, did a lot of pioneering work on this. 
the, the Iranians did, uh, 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 with Prime Minister Mossadegh displaced the British from Iran in and, uh, control of the Abadan oil refinery and control of uh, Iraq, Persia's oil in 1953. And Churchill and his government, it's Churchill in charge, he's taken totally by surprise. You know, the great hero in World War II doesn't have a clue what to do. They run desperately to America to get Prime Minister Mossadegh, who was not a communist, but is a, a democratic nationalist, toppled. And the Americans do it, but they don't let the British back in. They take over Iran's oil for the next quarter of a century until they in their turn are toppled in the Islamic revolution in 1978, 1979 and driven out. But US policy from 1945 to 1960s is very explicit, displace Britain from the Middle East. And it so happens, again, your timing is perfect, Peter, because I'm just this week reading two new books on this, uh, relatively new, one by a wonderful British uh, journalist and historian called Peter Hitchens, not Christopher Hitchens, who I knew very well personally, and who is a drunken slow and vastly overrated, but his brother Peter is vastly underrated. And he's written a wonderful book called The Hollow Victory about uh, how the US displaced Britain in World War II. And uh, you find also something I've just come across, Matt, you and Cynthia must also read, you too, Peter, a book called The Deluge by a great American modern historian called Adam Tooze, T-O-O-Z-E, published a few, just a few years ago. And Tooze uh, has an extraordinary section in the book where Warren Harding has just become president of the United States in 1921, and he has appointed Charles Evans Hughes as a secretary of state. Evans Hughes is a figure of huge distinction. He's already been uh, 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 governor of New York State. He's been Republican candidate for the presidency who only lost the race to Woodrow Wilson by the tiniest whisker in 1916. And he will later on become a, a, a Supreme Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who is so effective and powerful that he has wits and blocks Franklin Roosevelt himself. This is a huge figure in modern American history. And he has Geddes, the British ambassador to Washington. And this is you know, only three, less than three years after victory in World War I. And twos, the, the, the exchange between them is recorded accurately at the time. The, the Secretary of State of the United States screams at the British ambassador, we will not accept, uh, yeah, we will not accept British naval supremacy anymore. We demand parity with you and you will give it. Why? If, you ha if it had not been for us entering the war, you would be talking to somebody from Germany right now. You will also uh, uh, dismantle your system of imperial preference for the colonies. And if you do not, there will be a naval race such as the world has never seen, and we will expand the United States Navy till it is 10 times the size of your pathetic Royal Navy, which you cannot afford to keep anyway, this was true, and we will sink it. And you will also abandon your alliance in the Far East with Japan to safeguard your Eastern Empire. And the British back down. Wow. And they know that, uh, uh, incidentally, then Charles Evan Hughes wins, does defuse peacefully an arms race with Britain, but he exerts a price for it. The Washington Naval Treaty of 1921 scraps 60 battleships with American and British ones, but the British, for the first time in 300 years, agree, no more, since the Spanish Armada, 350 years agree to be up to parity with the United States. And Japan's Navy is now allowed to grow to a size so that if the United States does not come with Britain, Britain can no longer defend its Eastern Empire. And this is the direct consequence of the treaties of 1921, which is completely recognized by the Australian and the British imperial governments at the time. There is only one British figure, in, a strategist, who sees no danger coming from Japan, Winston Churchill. He refuses to approve financing to build a major naval base that can defend itself at Singapore. 
And he repeatedly says in his state papers as finance minister, the chancellor of the exchequer through the 1920s, why the idea of a war with Japan is absurd. It will not happen in my lifetime. But the key point here fits into the mysterious and convenient death of President Harding in 1923. President Harding in American history and British historiography has gone down as a lazy, amiable, corrupt figure. Modern American conservatives worship Calvin Coolidge. They have no time for President Harding. But the truth was the opposite. And look up, you will love... Uh, 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 with anyone else here too because no, nobody has re reads anything I write but in my book cycles of change which is only available I, I think uh, yeah, from either my website or from Amazon but it, it, uh, it's it only in Kindle format it's an e-format I make the specific points that first of all Calvin Coolidge was one of the most ineffectual presidents in American history much worse than Joe Biden could ever be because his son had tragically died uh, right after he won the election of 1924, and he was a state of easily diagnosed clinical depression for the entire four years of his presidency. He slept between 12 to 16 hours a day. He never said more than two or three words to anyone. Because he was a highly intelligent and witty man, the handful of words he said were actually very witty and enjoyable, but they were hiding up the heartbreaking reality that his 16-year-old son had died of an infection which today he would simply have been given anti antibiotic or penicillin for. He was playing tennis without socks on the White House uh, uh, tennis court and he got an infection. And it broke his father's heart. And so the father was a totally useless president. I sometimes, to entertain myself, have gone up to friends who are practicing and distinguished therapists and said to them, how would you diagnose? I know someone who has these symptoms. And I simply give them the exact lifestyle and details of President Harding. And the reaction is always the same. Compassion, horror and a sense of alarm. My God, Martin, uh, who is this person? Bring them into us immediately. Uh, you know, that they could commit suicide, and even if they don't, they, they could cause, end, cause accidents, or, you know, uh, they are dangerous to themselves and everyone else. These are terribly classic clinical cases of depression. So this is the much, uh, the, the man the conservatives revere. They loathe Harding because these people are all prudes, and poor Harding liked to have a good time. I had a girlfriend in the White House with whom he had an age of a daughter, and liked to drink when the, the rest of the country pretended to take the absurdities of prohibition seriously, and all the rest of it. But he was a great American patriot. He was a good and kind and humane man. He freed Eugene Debs from federal penitentiary, where he had been tortured under, under the orders of Woodrow Wilson as a, communist, as a communist subversive, which he never was. And not only is the great socialist leader Debs free from the White House, but President Harding then brings some, invites him to the White House for Christmas dinner. This is the kind of man he was. He was also the first sitting president to openly uh, and declare his support for a Jewish national home in Palestine. But he was also deeply opposed to the reimposition of the British Empire. He was the successor to the national policies of President William McKinley. And you never hear any of this, any of it. All the credit for the great prosperity of the 20s is given to Coolidge. When Coolidge deserves none of it, he simply coasts along for four years on the foundation that Harding, who worked himself to death in the White House, built for him. But again, Peter, thank Martin, you. Th thank you, uh, Martin. I wish to share uh, in following up in your comments about President Harding that Ryan Please. Walters wrote a concise, highly readable, fact-laden, 194-page biography of uh, President Harding and called entitled "The Jazz Age President." Oh, I'll Martin chase that Walters. up. Thank you. And it, that, and I will also thank you for you know your uh, recitation of uh, global naval history between 1920 and 1921, and those those points that you make they never taught at Annapolis, unfortunately. They would. Uh, they, they thought it was good that the, the the British agreed to parody after World War One, but they they do remember uh, Secretary Hughes 
sinking all those millions of tons of, uh, of battleship tonnage. But the, and, then, and then they would tell us, but you know what? He wasn't, he wasn't bad because he left the aircraft carriers alone. But, and, but isn't that also true? It, uh, if I may, uh, you especially, but Matt, Cynthia, everyone, I, there's a wonderful book. Uh, in fact, uh, I still give lectures to Navy and Air Force audiences around the country, and I'm just back from one actually in, 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 down in Florida last week. And the organizer of many of the conferences often says to me, Marty, you quote too many books for our audience, but he says, there's one book I love that I always give you permission to re refer to. And this is a brilliant man himself, but the book is The Collapse of British Power by Corelli Barnett, C-O-R-R-E-L-L-I, second name B-A-R-N-E-T-T. And it's really British history from 1920 to 1940. And it includes the political and diplomatic history. It includes the Washington Conference and much else and the rise of Nazism and why they failed to deal with it. But most of all, it goes into how British strategic and cultural thinking corrupted and became soft and naive and far from, I mean, they still had great ruthlessness at operational levels in their empires. You, you, one just has to look at what happened to the two kings of Iraq or the way they, uh, there was an excellent recent book by Caroline El Elkins, I think it's called The Violence of Empire, which has been, uh, to this day, the, the archives of the British colonial police around all the world are still under lock and guard in and outside London. They have never been open to the public. The 50 and 30 years rule, which permits open access to virtually all British government documentation over the past hundred years, has never been applied to the archives of the old colonial police forces across a quarter of the world. Now, this is extraordinary. At the very least, it, you know, it raises the question, why? Why? We're in the 21st century now. The British Empire has been gone effectively for nearly 80 years. Why is all this stuff still under lock and key? As is so often the case, especially in Jewish and American political traditions, you don't need to come up with a definitive answer. The framing of the question itself will lead you along the right path. There's a lot of clues and anomalies that would lead the curious mind into a higher sense of what is actually shaping our world. Um, I have a question and there's, I have so many questions, but I know we're running out of time and I, we have a, a conference call pretty soon. So I think this is going to be, I have to pick the, the, the least complicated question that was pressing into the back of my mind, which was Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, did he fall off his bike? Yes. I mean, there is, of course, a conspiracy theory. There are conspiracy theories about everyone. But he was an accident waiting to happen. Okay. He was a loon. Uh, this is a man, uh, uh, Kaduri wrote an, uh, an essay about him, prescient for its time. Richard Aldington, back in the 1970s, I think, wrote a biography, or the 80s, wrote a biography called A Prince of Our Disorder. The one, uh, when I discuss him briefly in my book, Politically Incorrect, into the Middle East, I say, as a historian, as a guerrilla leader, he's a total phony, but at least he leaves us with the record of some highly entertaining fetishists that he was involved, fetishisms that he was involved in. This is a twisted creep. He really, really is. He's not heterosexual. He's, uh, he's not conventionally gay. I, 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 I'm not going to slander uh, a, 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 anybody of any uh, uh, conventional orientation by comparing them with Lawrence. Lawrence, after the war, joins up to the Royal Air Force as a supposedly anonymous serving man when he's one of the most famous people in the world and a close friend of George Bernard Shaw and Winston Churchill's. He gets illiterate soldiers and manages to, to get them under his psychological spell. Why does he does he want to sexually uh, rape them or molest them? No, he does not. He wants them to molest him. He insists uh, that they whip him naked repeatedly, and this goes on for about ten or twelve years. 
And at the same time this is going on, this twit is also one of the most famous people in the world. He produces a book which is supposedly acclaimed as a work of world history, literature, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. He surrounds that with lies as well. He claims to have written the book, then lost his only copy of it on a rail, uh, uh, on a rail at a railway station or on a train, and then he has to write it again from memory, or so he claims. There is almost no history in the book. The book contains a record of uh, uh, Lawrence being raped by an evil Turkish uh, military governor, which is even included indirectly in the movie uh, Lawrence of Arabia, except it did not happen. He was nowhere near the Turkish site in the question at the time. This has been documented. There are dozens of Arab... You know, with Lawrence, you do not know what is real and what is not real. He's a fantasist. And as a fantasist, of course, Winston Churchill loved him. And he liked to drive his motorcycle at high speeds. And it, it reminds me, actually, Field Marshal Montgomery, who was the, the outstanding British military commander in World War II, crucial figure in winning the war, admirable fellow, and interesting of the British ruling class always hated him. And so did Churchill. But there's a parallel story here, another Churchill favorite, Ord Wingate, who actually is revered in Israel for helping train the first generation of soldiers in the Israeli army. But Wingate was another crackpot lunatic who was quite insane. And he leads a column of British uh, uh, commandos against the Japanese in Burma in World War II in 1944, gets most of them tortured and killed, and then dies himself in a plane crash. And when news of the plane crash is brought to Field Marshal Montgomery, who's halfway around the world commanding uh, British and American forces in Europe at the time, 21st Army Group, right? Montgomery's reaction is, you know, the man was an absolute menace, best thing really, that he got, he got himself killed, you know? Uh, Mon Montgomery's attitude was that dealing with dangerous lunatics like that, uh, they'll always cause more grief and suffering and chaos for thousands or millions of innocent people. And sure enough, at the 1921 Cairo conference, where Churchill draws up the map of the modern Middle East, where he invents Palestine, where he invents Jordan, and where he invents Iraq, a country where you cannot even find the word on a map before 1921. It is two separate Turkish provinces in Mesopotamia, and they were separate when they were Assyria versus Babylonia two and a half thousand years ago. Modern Iraq never existed. It is invented by Winston Churchill on the spur of the moment when he's riding on a camel beside his wife Clementine on one side, and Lawrence of Arabia is sitting on the other camel beside him on the other. If you look up now, you'll find the photograph. It's a very famous one. It, it's still floating around. But Winston loved to listen to these idiots. And even worse, he took them seriously. Huh. And FDR did not take Churchill seriously. Mm -hmm. And going on a bit here, but I recommend here volume one of the three volume biography of FDR in World War II. Uh, I think called The Face of Command, but I may be wrong on that, but it's by Nigel Hamilton. And it's FDR's first year of command from Pearl Harbor to Operation Torch to the, the landing in North Africa. And the key theme there is that Churchill keeps panicking, keeps losing battles, keeps sending British armies and fleets to be sunk and captured and destroyed, melts down in complete panic, and it is repeatedly President Roosevelt and General Marshall and the US Navy who repeatedly rescue the British again and again. And this is the, exactly the opposite of the Valiant Years myth that I grew up on and I worshiped. You know, if you read the Sec Churchill's history of the Second World War, FDR, of course, had died in 1945. Churchill is safely slandering a dead man. He is safely slandering a dead man. Uh, he says President Roosevelt was an amateur. I, of course, was the great warlord, the great hero, uh, the great visionary. FDR was an amateur. He was naive. Stalin took him, him in. He never took me in. It was Churchill who surrendered most of all of the Balkans and most of Eastern Europe to Stalin in October 1944 on a document he signed at a drunken dinner with Stalin in the Kremlin. Churchill even gave it the title, The Dirty, uh, uh, the dirty Agreement. 
because A, it was so dishonorable, but B, they signed it on a soil napkin uh, because it was the only paper at hand while, while they were lowering endless quantities of, of vodka at, uh, at, uh, you know, in, a, in a typical Kremlin celebration. <laughs> I'm sorry, Annie. You've done it again, Matt. You, you you happily enticed me into into further stuff. No, no. I I, <laughs> I would be disappointed if an if an answer ever ended exactly in a literal <laughs> way that I I intended. Uh, no, that's good. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Well, it, we're rounding about to the nine thirty mark, at least here in the uh, the Eastern Standard Time, and we we had you have a conference call to go to, so. Marty, I thank you so much for doing this. We'll have to have a conversation and discuss a future presentation because, uh, again, there's so many threads that have just been pulled on uh, that I'm curious to see how they unravel. And uh, everyone, thank you for, uh, for showing up tonight. And uh, this coming Sunday, we're going to have a presentation by Michael Claridge, uh, from the, uh, who, headed the SAP, or who heads the Sapphire Project um, and is a leading figure in the Electric Universe uh, movement. So he's going to do something on Luc Montagnier, Light and Life. We're going to have Ray McGovern do something the week afterwards and a lot more good things coming up around the bend. So, If I can only chime in there for a brief moment. Yeah. I dealt with Ray personally as a friend and colleague in, in, in media issues for 20 years, and you could not come across a better man. All right. A better human being. He's not just brilliant. He's, he's just one of those exceptional people. So if you had any doubts of whether you should be there for Ray McGovern in two weeks... I, I didn't. I'm Listen, no, I was, talking, I was talking to the audience out there. Oh, well, Marty yeah. testifies <laughs> that you should be there. <laughs> exactly. Good. All right, everyone. Thank you all for showing up. And till next time. Thank you, Marty. My pleasure, Matt. Thank you. Bye.